All right, not in the least. And I'm now sharing my screen. So I'm going to begin with this. Kabul circa 1775. Abundant praise be to God, although now the respected aforementioned Mahduma, literally one who is served, has no need of permission, but since it is a tradition of our predecessors that without permission a peer, meaning a Sufi master, cannot in this serious matter take a single step, thus in written form it is enshrined that whosoever from all women and men that seek the path of transcendent God can come to her service and take the path from her even if they have received it from this poverty-stricken one. What you're looking at here are the final lines of a three-page diploma issued by Khwaja Safiullah of Kabul, scholar and saint of Afghanistan and much of South and Central Asia, to his premier student and successor, Bibi Sahiba Kalan. Kalan here meaning great or exalted. Today, we'll introduce the subject of this diploma. This rather remarkable figure, the female Sufi saint and scholar Bibi Sahaba Kalan, who passed away in 1803, who was designated the first of the inheritors of the most important Sufi order based in Afghanistan, with branches all the way to Western China and the Indian Ocean. And suffice it to say, two of her nephews actually briefly became kings of Yarkand in Xinjiang in, in Western China. This is after the Dungan revolts in 1863, but that's another story that I write about elsewhere. So we're going to begin by setting the stage. Entering into the world of Sufism in the Afghan Empire. Then I'll introduce Bibi Sahiba and her career, and how her authority has been conceived in her biographical tradition. I'll then follow her journey into the Afghan heartlands, onwards to the holy sanctuaries of Mecca and Medina, and the sacred epicenters of Central Asia, where her story draws to a close. And at the end, I'm going to touch upon a much larger topic, I will not be able to do justice to it, on how Bibi Sahiba and her contemporaries engendered a new prototype of Islamo-Persianate female religious leadership that was consciously distinguished from earlier models of sainthood. So, I realize the world we're about to enter may be unfamiliar to some of us, so I'm going to take some time aside and introduce first the geography, and then the place of Sufism in the Afghan empire. So in terms of geography, this is our board. We've got modern day Pakistan um, right in the middle and Afghanistan right above it, obviously India to the right. And where you see Bukhara is modern day Uzbekistan. This is our landscape. Now, without delving into details, the 18th century where a story takes place is a time of fragmentation. But in 1750, a new Afghan empire grows up around three cities. So pay close attention. We're going to go back to these quite a bit. One is, of course, Kabul, in um, which you see in eastern Afghanistan, Kandahar to the south, and Peshawar, which is now in northwestern Pakistan. At its height, the empire stretches from India all the way to Iran. And as a result, students and artists and scholars from literally as far as China and Istanbul start rushing into these cities and they become cosmopolitan centers, hosting dozens of colleges and vibrant Jewish, Armenian, Hindu, uh, Shia and Sunni communities. And then bit by bit, we have a host of other smaller kingdoms that were emerging around the Afghan empire. I'm not going to bore you with all the details here, but pay close attention to this little kingdom of Sindh that you see at the bottom of the map. Uh, which is a subsidiary state of the empire, and this is going to factor prominently into our story. So with that, on to Sufism. Now, Sufism, of course, is the mystical core of Islam. At the time we're looking at, it was an actual science of inner purification and eliminating the, e the lower ego self, the nafs, through rigorous practices, through meditation, through seclusion, through ethical conduct, through social service, and in many traditions, sacred movement and music. Now, Sufi teachings had some distinct schools, and the word that's used is tariqa, turuq is the plural in Arabic. It literally means path. So think of a school. It's got its own method of meditation, its philosophies, its own practices. And by the 11th century, Sufism is synthesized with the other Islamic sciences, like law, 
like theology, like philosophy, like astronomy, like cosmology, so on and so forth. So the most important take home here is that from very early on, Sufism was an integral component of Orthodox Islam and a companion to Islamic law. So law regulates the outer life, Sufism regulates the inner life, and there's a logic to it. So consider if you are in the 18th century and you have just studied law and you are rotten on the inside, then you will probably end up becoming a blood-sucking lawyer like many lawyers we know today. And if you are a Sufi who has, let's say, experienced various internal states, been exposed to several mystical secrets, but you're not bound within the confines of the law, or let's just call it good, decent behavior, then you're likely to become a cult leader like many Sufis today. So that means that if you were living in Bibi Sahiba's Kabul, you couldn't be a religious scholar unless you were a practicing Sufi and vice versa. This is, by the way, very different from a popular conception today that Sufis are these sort of free spirits and marginalized or outside of orthodoxy. Right, so if you're living in, let's say, 18th century Kabul and you wanted to be a scholar, what would you do? You'd begin at age uh, four days, four months, four years by going to a maktab, an elementary school. And then you'd move on to a madrasa, think something between a high school and college where you'd learn law, scripture, poetics, philosophy, grammar, cosmology, medicine, so on and so forth. And then you'd move on to the Sufi center, a bit like a PhD program. Uh, the term that I'll be using here is Hanaka, which is a, is a local term that's used for the Sufi center. And in addition to this, we're going to add the much lesser known Haram Sarai, which is a female-led institution within the Sufi center, illuminated uniquely by this study. Now, by the 18th century, the Sufi path, the mystical journey, was down to a science. You've got teachers' textbooks, stages of mystical realization, literally step-by-step -step guidelines on how to become enlightened. Now, each Sufi path grows through the appointment of multiple deputies. And the word that's used is Khalifa. It's the very same word as Caliph, literally one who follows. So you open up a school and you have a uh, promising student and then you appoint that promising student to run it or to teach there. Now, Bibi Sahiba belonged to the Naqshbandi Mujaddidi Sufi path. So this is a, a term that we should hold on to. It's founded by a... 17th century philosopher, scholar, mystic named Sir Hindi, who was arguably one of the most influential figures in the Muslim world, and we're going to return to him at the end. He was known as the reviver of the second millennium of Islam. Now, what are some defining features of this particular Sufi path? It was the most expansive network in the Muslim world before the 20th century, literally from Indonesia all the way to Bosnia. In fact, the... Um, the first president of Afghanistan after the civil war in the early 1990s was from this path, Sibratullah Mujaddidi, and in fact, he was descended from Bibi Sahiba's teacher, a direct descendant. Now, the Naqshbandi Mujaddidis, I'll be calling them Mujaddidis, they are Sunnis and they venerate the 12 Imams. This is very common in the pre-20th century, in fact, more common than not in pre-20th century Sunnism. Now, most important, they had very sophisticated and scientific methods of inner purification, grounded in the Qur'an and in the prophetic traditions. With specific meditations and breathing practices, they could enliven these metaphysical centers that were mapped onto the physical body, almost like receptors, to receive divine energy, and through these could journey towards self-realization with about 50 plus stages. And for those who may not be familiar with this, this was actually orthodox Islamic practice, uh, really certainly before the 20th century. Everyone from the great scholars to the shopkeeper to the Ottoman kings and the Mughal princesses are practicing this. Uh, and aside, at this time, Wahhabism was actually considered a heresy. Uh, if you want, I'm going to give a, a shameless pitch to my, my first book, Hidden Caliphate. I believe in chapter four, you can read all about it. Now, the point of this particular Sufi path was not to achieve ecstasy or union with God and to enter into some sort of uh, kind of airy-fairy state. It was to become a servant of God and God's creation, a sober teacher who can guide others, who is practical, who is engaged and enlightened, one who is steadfast on Sharia. 
So if everyone's with me, this is Bibi Sahiba's world. Now, this case study challenges certain ingrained assumptions. On the one hand, it uncovers the vibrant social cultural scene of Afghanistan and Pakistan and their neighbors, which really have been treated like civilizational backwaters due to recent years of conflict. And the academic literature reflects this bias, especially with regards to Afghanistan. We have not really, the post-colonial turn has not really hit Afghanistan per se. But of course, the most obvious is in the realm of women's studies, specifically in the context of the Muslim world, even more so in Central Asia and Afghanistan. These days, of course, all the discourse is dominated by the Taliban. So this story comes to most as a surprise and to many in the area, I've actually found it deeply inspirational. I was briefly um, teaching some courses in Pakistan and some students of mine even made a, a claymation film on Bibi Sahiba's life. Now for historians, um, scholars of religious studies, we know that women were active participants in the religious or the broader scholastic domain in this part of the world. And how do we know this? We know this to scattered references in the Arabic and the Persian sources. It may mention that some Sufi master has appointed as his Khalifa, as his deputy, such and such woman, Just generally one line references. And we know this from the many, many, many shrines. Literally, I, I would argue every 15 miles within this, perhaps every 20 miles, you're going to find some shrine dedicated to a, a female Sufi. But they receive very little attention because the data just isn't there. And when you ask around at shrines, and if anyone's in that part of the world, I challenge you to do this. Go to the caretaker of the shrine or to anyone there and say, who's buried here? And what are you going to get? You're going to get she prayed all night. Uh, she fasted. She was stayed veiled. She was pious. She was noble. That's it. And sometimes the stories get bizarre. Often she's chased. Sometimes the she gets swallowed up by the ground um, to preserve her chastity, and then the story stops. And the colonial sources, God forbid, would they ever acknowledge female religious leaders? And I'll give you a stark example here. Uh, the famous um, Sir Richard Burton, translator of A Thousand and One Nights. So he is um, in Sindh in the uh, about the mid 19th century in southern Pakistan. And he mentions uh, a female saint of his time there who happens to be from the same Mujaddidi path as Bibi Sahiba. And he says nothing except that she must have been sexually promiscuous. No comment. Now, about 12 years ago, when I was traveling in Afghanistan, I, uh, I found a book, 450 pages in Persian and Arabic, which to my surprise contained one of the most detailed biographical accounts of a female scholar saint of the early modern period. And this is how I was introduced to Bibi Sahiba. It was a chance encounter. I was not expecting this world to open up. Now, it turns out that this book, the principal biography of Bibi Sahiba's Sufi lineage, was composed by her son only 14 years after her death. So he was her son. He was her confidant. He was her actually her disciple and her travel companion. So he was able to furnish intimate details of his mother's career, even capturing her emotional state in formative moments in her life. Her voice is also preserved within the text, albeit, of course, through the vantage point of the sun. Then in fieldwork in southern Pakistan, in an absolutely charming historic town called Matiari, not so far from the Indus, I met Bibi Sahiba's descendants, who shared with me the manuscripts of their forefathers. And after this, I was able to collect oral histories and books in 20 towns as far as the Great Thar Desert on the India-Pakistan border, where Bibi Sahiba's descendants and followers took refuge in the process discovering at least 10 other Sufi masters connected to this Sufi lineage with significant following. So now I had to literally add three and a half chapters to my book. And here we're not talking about someone sitting there with five friends and with prayer beads, uh, with no, no disrespect to that, we're talking disciples in the thousands, we are talking about spiritual political power brokers. Now, all of this is very fresh, I'm going to share with you. Um, recently, I got a, a WhatsApp message from Kandahar in Afghanistan. A gentleman sends me the picture to the right, which is my picture with this kind of funny green circle around my face. And he says, is this you? And I respond, I say, yes, this is me. And then he sends me the picture to the left and he says, this is me. 
it turns out that this man, Hikmatullah Mujaddidi, is the religious leader who presides over Bibi Sahiba's family shrine in Kandahar, where her son and her father, uh, sorry, her husband are buried. And he informed me that he's been hearing about my work and they've got many documents they'd like to share with me. And so far he sent me a PDF of a rare biographical dictionary from Kandahar. And I'm hoping for more materials soon. Now it's vital to note that this story is not just about Bibi Sahiba. It points to a much larger story of hundreds of such contemporary women who are marginalized in the sources. It provides context for many female religious leaders in Central and Southern Asia, the ones whose shrines dot the landscape. And of course, if you're interested, after the talk, we can talk about the politics of silence. Now on to our story with this rather long introduction. Bibi Sahiba's Sufi guide was Khwaja Safiullah, the most renowned Sufi scholar of the Afghan empire. In the 1770s, he set up a college in Kabul in a place called Shor Bazar, which is a very famous neighborhood of musicians and storytellers and mystics in the heart of the city. It's much more quiet now. This madrasa and Sufi center that he set up drew students from as far as the Pamir Mountains in Badakhshan in Central Asia and the Arabian Sea. Now, as an aside, 1770s Kabul, this is a time when one of Kabul's notable poets was a queen, Aisha Durrani. And incidentally, her work, which is a several hundred page divan, it's a po poetic compilation, was the first lithograph ever published in Afghanistan in the latter 19th century. Just keep that in mind. Now, Bibi Sahiba's teacher was revered by two Afghan kings. In 1793, the king Zaman Shah, in fact, the newly minted King Zaman Shah actually walked on foot from Kabul's royal fort to the alleyways of Shor Bazar so Khwaja Safiullah would tie his coronation turban. This is the uh, ceremony known as the Dastar Bandi. Now, Khwaja Safiullah appointed over 30 deputies to manage his sacred scholastic network, which extended from, as I said, Central Asia to the Arabian Sea. Now, these deputies were not sort of run-of-the-mill people, they included the top scholars of the time. Uh, Justin Sindh alone, southern Pakistan, one of the deputies wrote over 30 works in Arabic, Persian, and Sindhi on meditation, poetry, law, you name it. And his broader network of disciples, or let's say those connected to his order, was actually over 200,000. Another was from the most famous family of Qadis, of judges in the region, Yet another was unquestionably the most influential jurist in the region. His magnum opus was a massive text on legal opinion and method, and there was a copy in every madrasa until the 20th century. And this is Sindh. Now you go up to Badakhshan in the Pamir Mountains, the most famous of the, I would say, deputy companions was probably the most well-known poet saint of Badakhshan at the time. If you are familiar with the area, it's Riyasuddin Badakhshi. Now, among all of these larger-than-life deputies of Khwaja Safiullah, the Khalifat al-Awwal, the first of the deputies, was Amat al-Masum, better known as Bibi Johnny Jahan, better known as Bibi Sahiba Kalan. In the biographies, she is described as the first and the most perfect and the great deputee. By the way, there's a chain of biographies, of course, which, uh, which cover her life. Now, Bibi Sahiba was probably born in Peshawar in 1752, so in northwestern Pakistan today, and hailed from a scholarly saintly Sayyid family, descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, again, as an aside, it's interesting that her great aunt, 300 years earlier, was the female saint Bibi Jaivindi, about whom we know very little except her spectacular shrine in central Pakistan that you see before you, indicates that she was a noteworthy figure. And literally in the last two months, I have found 10 biographical entries of Bibi Jaivindi and none of them go beyond saying she is pious and the name of the person who commissioned the tomb. We're thinking about. Now at an early age, Bibi Sahiba uh, in Peshawar had memorized the Quran, studied Islamic law, theology and Greco-Arabic medicine. And at age seven, even began her training in Sufi practices. This is early by any standards. 
The college in Peshawar that she grew up was a spectacular place. Uh, it was provided by a very wealthy, noble Afghan family. There were many acres of land, there were gardens, there were courtyards. In fact, when Bibi Sahiba was young, there were so many women at the Sufi center that some nearby scholars even registered a complaint. It's a very funny story I can share with you. Now, in the 1760s, Bibi Sahiba arrived at Kabul and Kandahar. In 1769, she married a distant relative about three to four years her younger. And although her husband became a refu re reputed Sufi, he's got a interesting poetic work on um, mystical practices. In the biographies, he is generally known in reference to his wife. Now, by this time, Bibi Sahiba was already a promising young scholar. Husband and wife often lived apart. Her husband was often on the road in northern areas of, of Kabul, also towards Kandahar. And she was managing two Sufi centers in Kandahar and mostly in Kabul while pursuing her own training. And what you see before you is an 1840s representation of the, the greater lineal institution in Kandahar. This is the shrine of Hazrat Kandahari, who was her uncle. Yeah, her sort of roundabout. Now, over the next two decades, Bibi Sahiba educated several hundred scholars and Sufis. Uh, she was financially independent, and the family had inherited about 4,000 acres of land around Kandahar, which the governors had granted for their scholastic endeavors. This land was probably eventually put in her name. We don't have any sources actually for this land. The, the documents are no longer there, but I have comparative sources, uh, which I can touch upon later on, which indicate that this is what would have happened. Oral histories tell us that later a large portion of this 4,000 acres, in fact, 1,000 acres was transformed into a wildlife preserve where hunted animals would come for uh, refuge. Now the biographical narratives allow us to reconstruct the sources and the nature of her authority and what this implied at the day-to-day -day level. Her authority is defined through several titles. So among them, the first of the deputies, so the word Khalifa, this is her vis-a-vis -vis her teacher as a kind of number two to her teacher, the peer, the Sufi master, that's her vis-a-vis -vis the students, the community at large, and really, I would argue, the cosmos. And there is the third, which is the second Fatima, which is, it's a, it's a whole chapter in my book. Uh, we will not be able to do, ju do justice to the third title within this hour. Now, the biographical episodes focusing on her teacher, Khwaja Safiullah, where Bibi Sahiba plays a secondary role are perhaps the most revealing with regard to her day-to-day -day life and of course her association with her teacher. She is at once a personal confidant, a manager of the affairs of the Sufi center and a voice of reason. In these stories, we often encounter her voice as the narrator or catch glimpses of her daily activities which are unencumbered by all the formalities and the tropes within her own biographical entry which follows a very form formulaic structure. Now consider this episode. In the 1780s, her teacher was in a state of advanced meditation where worldly possessions lost all meaning. This was quite common in their path. You would go through a period of sort of internal turmoil. Now, he had a sizable library of books, and he just ordered that they be donated to the poor. Bibi Sahiba stepped in and decided to preserve the library. The poor, she said, needed food. They did not need manuscripts. So she purchased all of the books with her own money, then distributed an equivalent amount to the poor to fulfill her teacher's intention. And in fact, among the books preserved is a 13th century Quran written in Baghdad, uh, which is now sitting with her descendants. In fact, a portion of this library is still intact. This is one among several episodes where we learn about her financial independence and her wealth through which she carried out charitable activities and building projects. Now, after finishing her training as the peer, Khwaja Safiullah issued Bibi Sahiba the three-page diploma that we began with, indicating that she had mastered the Sharia and designating her as the, the titles actually indicate that she is the greatest saint of the age um, and assigning all of his thousands of disciples, male and female, to her charge. It's an incredible document on which I can speak at length. Her teacher literally outlines each of her degrees and spiritual attainments. And we can actually use uh, the, the broader, let's say, um, um, Sufi practical tradition within their order to make sense of exactly what each of our attainments were and what kind of practices they required. 
Now, among the noteworthy points of this document are its lack of gender specificity. Within this document, she becomes Pir, the Sufi master. So as the Sufi master, she had the following responsibilities. Directing women, uh, well, actually, women and men's meditation, imparting literacy through the Quran, even advice on hygiene and health specifically to women, giving lectures on hadith, on jurisprudence and Sufism to advanced students, administering medical remedies and faith healing, and what we may today call mental health services. And we can get into this if you like, it is a fascinating topic. The sources tell us that Bibi Sahiba taught men from both within and outside the family, even imparting spiritual guidance to senior deputies of Khwaja Safiullah through a veil or a curtain to maintain strict gender segregation. Now, with the order well-established from Sindh to Kabul, Bibi Sahiba regularly received delegations of Sufis and scholars. The sources relay a story concerning a caravan, it's a story which I rather enjoy, which arrives at her Sufi center in Kandahar from over a thousand miles away, led by a famous Baloch poet and Darvesh, Ahmad Khan Nizamani, from a tiny village now four hours from Karachi called Nimjogot. Challenge anyone to find it on the map. Bibi Sahiba dispatched her very young son to receive the guest and specifically instructed him to go outside and request a prayer from Nizamani. Now the son granted, uh, greeted Nizamani and was disturbed by his unfamiliar features and darker complexion. So he goes back to his mother and he ashamedly admits that because of his appearance, he didn't ask for prayers. Bibi Sahiba was upset. And she told her son, quote, do not consider his physical appearance as his heart is as luminous as the full moon. When I approach the court of our prophet, peace be upon him, I see Nizamani seated at his feet. We are not rendered this honor. <clears throat> this hagiographical episode affirms, represents her wisdom and spiritual insight that can overcome racial difference and allow her to produce the two provide spiritual oversight over a vast multicultural zone. We are reminded of her ability to mediate across geographic, cultural, and ethnic difference. Now, just last year, I've, I've been telling the story for a long time, I met Nizamani's descendants who showed me the Quran that he had written by hand. It's an Arabic with a Persian translation. You're gonna see it to the, to the left. And then who confirmed their narrative of the story. And in fact, their narrative adds the meal that Nizamani was actually served by Bibi Sahiba. Now, the narratives at Kandahar and Kabul and elsewhere bear witness to the development of something called the Haram Sarai. It's also called a Haveli in the more Eastern sources. It's a space of spiritual training presided over by women, which exists in parallel to the male-dominated institutions of the Sufi center, the mosque, and the madrasa. Now, the Haram Sarai is an integral part of the larger institutional complex and essential to the diffusion of the Sufi path, attracting scores of women disciples and providing social services. Bibi Sahiba in her time administers the Haram Sarai. She presides over assemblies and she delivers lectures there. And her biographies provide some documentary evidence of its layout and its functionality. It has its own rooms for meditation, uh, its own storehouses, its own kitchen, its own library, in fact, where the, where the books are kept, access to stables and a separate entrance facing the street. Men would stand outside or on a porch to receive training and lectures from Bibi Sahiba, probably with a curtain or lattice in between, again, for gender segregation. The Haram Sarai has its own finances, uh, its own waqf, with a separate endowment um, and its own parallel system of distribution of food and alms to Muslim and Hindu mendicants in Kabul. The interlocutors between the Haram Sarai and the male spaces are often male relatives or particular designated individuals. In fact, there's a kind of the workaround to the gender segregation is that there's a, a vast network of men who are tied by milk kinship. So in fact, several hundreds who may be connected to the family that then sort of create a broader sort of family within a family. And these individuals then deliver messages and welcome visitors. And in my book, I focus on the physical layout, uh, the functionality and the management of the various Haram Sarais, literally the, the nuts and bolts of how they function. Now, in 1797, Bibi Sahiba joined her teacher, 
and over 300 companions for a historic Hajj voyage through Afghanistan, through Balochistan, through the then very, very small port of Karachi to Yemen and beyond. Bibi Sahiba was accompanied by her daughter, Bibi Amatullah, known as Bibi Sahiba II, Bibi Sahiba Sani, who was a budding scholar and Sufi in her own right, and her two sons, the elder of whom chronicled the events of her physical and the spiritual journey. Now, however, when they reached Hudaydah, a port in Yemen, Fawja Safiola fell ill and eventually passed away, in fact, on the boat. The spiritual and financial affairs of the Hajj caravan fell to Bibi Sahiba. In fact, before his death, she took on the debts, for those who may be aware of the, of the uh, significance of that. In fact, the debt of Hajj Safiullah and the entire caravan. She builds her teacher's tomb and, and a madrasa in Yemen, and then leads the whole caravan for Hajj, during which, as related by her sons, she reaches her spiritual heights and has a sequence of mystical visions before she reaches sobriety again. She said, when I became attentive, I found myself to be the Kaaba, and I perceived my four limbs as the four prayer spaces. Each time she approached the black stone on the Kaaba, a voice would call out to her, come, O beloved one, come, O accepted one. In Medina, too, now in her son's words, at every step she received new grants, the prophet appeared to her and presented her with a green robe. Now in her words, the prophet's daughter, Fatima, kissed my forehead and I was drowned in her association. She asked me to be seated in the way in which an honored guest is received. Now on the return journey through Sindh, they reached a place called, you'll see it right at the bottom called Mutalavi, it's called Matyari now, where her daughter fell ill and also passed away. And this was in fact a medieval pilgrimage town, as I said, near the Indus River. According to popular stories, the body was placed on the back of a camel which was to decide the burial ground. So this is in, in many ways, for those familiar with the story, kind of mirror of the, um, the trope in Medina when the prophet arrives and the camel decides where he's going to stay. So in Matyari, Bibi Sahiba built a shrine for her daughter and a mosque and a school in her honor, which remain a local sacred site. In fact, two centuries after the fact, Bibi Sahiba's Hajj is still remembered by the people of Matyari, both Muslim and Hindu. Now, Bibi Sahiba then returned to Afghanistan. So via what you see here, Shikarpur, Kalat, and back to Kandahar. And uh, then she travels to Kabul, through Peshawar and Lahore, through to the city of Sirhind in North India, to the shrine of Sheikh Ahmad Sirhindi, who is her spiritual ancestor. Then she returns back to Kabul and receives an invitation from none other than Amir Haydar, the king of Bukhara. Now, Bukhara was the fabled scholastic capital of Central Asia, which along with Peshawar at the time, was the great college town, and of course, Bibi Sahiba's ancestral home. At Amir Haydar's time, there were actually 80 madrasas in Bukhara, and by his grandson's time, there are 365. It's not an exaggeration. There's a colleague of mine who I think literally listed each one of the, the colleges um, that existed by the 1850s. The interesting thing about Bukhara is that the King Amir Haidar was not just a ruler, but a licensed Sufi guide in Bibi Sahiba's own Mujaddidi Sufi path. His teacher was Bibi Sahiba's contemporary from the city of Peshawar, who I write about, in fact, in my book, Hidden Caliphate. He's also an academic. Uh, he spends several hours a day lecturing on exegesis and hadith. And in fact, some people complain he's spending too much time in the Sufi center and lecturing and not paying too much attention to the affairs of governance. Um, I actually have a collection of 130 letters um, uh, written between him and his Sufi master, where you get a very intimate sense of the relationship between the two, uh, thanks to the work of Anke uh, Kugelgen. Now, um, Bibi Sahiba and her two sons went to Bukhara and they joined scholarly discussions at the Bukharan court. Then she uh, leaves Bukhara with her sons and on the way home in 1803, she too fell ill and passed away in a place called Mazari Sharif. This is in northern Afghanistan, not far from the Uzbek border. 
Mazar Sharif is the spiritual epicenter of Central Asia, and it's built ar around, uh, for those who may not be aware, the legendary shrine attributed to Imam Ali, the first of the Imams and the son-in-law of the Prophet. So he's believed to be buried in, in uh, Najaf as well as in Mazar Sharif, and there's some secondary locations as well, but these are generally the two. There's a, a dream narrative that goes along with it. It's a, it's a long story. Now, with Bibi Sahiba's exalted trans-regional reputation, the custodians of this shrine accorded her a saint's funeral. It was a ritualized public event, and she was given the rare honor of being buried under the second dome of Imam Ali's shrine complex. This is huge. Um, kings were not rendered this honor. And in fact, what you see here is um, the member of the Ansari family who was responsible for the burial. Uh, they, are, they have been for several hundred years the custodians of the shrine. Now, her two sons continued the journey home. The elder was to become a noteworthy poet and a writer and a father of one of Kandahar's principal saintly lineages. The younger became a scholar saint of the highlands north of Kabul, which I had visited um, uh, in, in fact, it's been almost about eight, nine years. Uh, this is the Sufi center that he set up there. And this is a place called Nijrao in, in Afghanistan. And he ended up as a mobilizer against the British forces when they first invaded Afghanistan in 1839. And he, in fact, was martyred uh, by the British at the hands of a Muslim assassin during the war. So for those who are familiar with the Muslim context, you can see this sort of how the story of her and her two sons ends up mirroring the life of Fatima and her sons Hassan and Hussein, the latter being the archetypal martyr in the Muslim context. But the story I'm writing continues well after Bibi Sahiba's passing away, and I did not expect this. In the 1880s, another crisis occurs in Afghanistan. British forces invade again. Bibi Sahiba's grandsons become major military mobilizers at famous battles like the Battle of Mayland. Several family members die fighting. Eventually, the forces, Afghan forces defeat the British, but after retreating, this new puppet ruler is planted, Amir Abdul Rahman, who um, Abdul Rahman then starts a bloody purge against the Sufi leadership, against the Shia, the Ismailis, and the animists uh, with an imperial stipend. Uh, it's a fascinating and a tragic story. So Bibi Sahiba's family migrate to Sin uh, in southern Pakistan to the shrine of Bibi Sahiba II, which becomes now the spiritual marker. And then from there to other places where they set up Sufi centers and madrasas. At this time, a new model of female spiritual authority was emerging in this whole region from Afghanistan to Sindh. The women of Bibi Sahiba's family were all trained scholars and Sufis. Several authored fatwas, legal opinions. And a great example is Bibi Sahiba's great-granddaughter, Amma Ji, who not only performed all-night meditations and uh, had her own students, but also worked with the famous Bi Amma, who is on this post-it stamp. For those who are familiar with the Indian um, and British colonial history, this is the mother of the Ali brothers who led the Muslim non-cooperation movement after World War I, during and after, and the Khilafat movement to preserve the Ottoman Empire. And they were very famously guided by their mother, who, as it turns out, was actually part of the same Mujaddidi Sufi order as Bibi Sahiba and considered Bibi Sahiba's great granddaughter, Ammaji, to be a spiritual guide. So Bibi Sahiba's great-granddaughter and Bi Amma, together we find them mobilizing the women of Sindh, giving public speeches in support of the Khilafat movement and raising a lot of money. And this is, again, this is an, as an aside, it's well known that, uh, that um, it's, it's, in fact, it's, it's regularly said that Indian women gave their jewelry and their money to support the nascent Turkish Republic and before that the... Um, the sort of uh, the Ottoman Empire in its in its last throes. What we don't really acknowledge is the role of the Sufi orders in mobilizing women in this effort. Sindh was actually one of the major mobilizing centers of the movement. Now, uh, Bibi Sahiba's great great grandson, so this is Ammaji's uh, son, was actually the head of the Khilafat and non cooperation movement in Sindh was in fact a, a cross Hindu Muslim uh, um, movement. And when he was jailed, she famously sent him a letter to the effect that if he in any way capitulated to the British, he, her milk was haram to him. It's tough love. 
but beyond that. Bibi Sahiba's grandsons befriended some influential Sufis in the Great Thar Desert in southeastern Pakistan and Rajasthan and Gujarat in western India, who they appointed as their deputies to spread the order further east. So ignore all of the lines on this map. There's a place right here called Tarparkar. This is where they were mostly based, moving into Palanpur and Gujarat, which you see at the bottom, also into Bhuj and into across Rajasthan. And this is what I'm finishing up right now, and which took me to over 20 towns and villages in the Thar Desert, where I discovered at least 10 women who were appointed by Bibi Sahiba's grandsons who headed sizable Sufi orders. Now, what's unusual here is that they were strictly orthodox, but half of their disciples were Hindu, many of them outcasts. So Bhils, Kolis, Mengwars, for those who may be familiar. And all of them were visited and revered by the leading Orthodox Sunni jurists and theologians of the region. And it's a world that entirely breaks the mold. The greatest of them was Dadi Mitta, a great saint with actually today hundreds of thousands of devotees all the way to Rajasthan. She was a fakir who lived humbly in a thatched mud hut, a bit like this, but was visited by male scholars from all the neighboring madrasas who would sit under a tree near her mosque, or communicate with her through a window or through messengers. She was very famous not only for her towering spiritual presence, uh, she's said to have had spiritual authority over the entire Great Desert, but was famous for negotiating disputes and protecting the rights of peasants. Also, by the way, in today's uh, Rajasthan, you'll find statues of her for puja. Now, I'll share uh, a story. Um, I'll summarize it. Here's the gist. In a village called Talar, now in Rajasthan, there were dozens of villages who were Dadi Mitta's disciples. In one of these villages, a man called Pabudan declares himself landlord and starts extracting money from peasants, and he harasses them with his armed guards. So a delegation of tribes from this region travels 200 miles to meet Dadi Mitta, asking her to intervene. She agrees to mediate and goes with a force of 250 men and women to negotiate with this rather villainous character. But he refuses to negotiate, and then he threatens and insults the group. And then she does something in the hagiography. She refuses to drink his water, which is basically tantamount to, you know, you've had it. So she went back, and she organized a defense force of 12 men and systematically planned their attack on Pabudan's armed guards. They managed to overcome the guards and took Pabudan and hung him upside down. And in fact, he was so humiliated by the event that he visited her and swore never to extort money from the poor again. And luckily, we've got multiple versions of this story from the bazaars of Umar Kot and several tribes who are affiliated with her. This is incredible because here you have a um, sort of traditional Orthodox woman in the 19th century who, in effect, assembles a vigilante force of disciples to protect the poor. And there are several stories to this effect of Dadi Mitta and several others. Now, Dadi Mitta has three deputies who are incredible women in their own right with their own spiritual following. Um, there's her companion, um, Dadi Saleha of the Mangrio clan, who set up a madrasa, a rather large madrasa in the late, latter 19th century. It's a rather interesting firsthand account um, of a, a boy who used to accompany her on his visits to um, meet Dadi Mitta. And he would relay that they could bend space and time uh, in the process of, of the travel. You also had Dadi Kandal Halipoto, who dressed in men's clothes, wore boots and a turban, uh, performed impossible fasts and seclusions, and refused to get married. In fact, told her brother to, that he's relieved of the duty to get her married. There's also Dadi Gulaba Nehriani, who would arrange for Dadi Mitta's tours to meet with and lecture to her disciples in Rajasthan. Now, I should mention another of the deputies of Bibi Sahiba's great-grandson is a man from the Great Desert named Miu Jan Muhammad, who's described as half-god intoxicated. He had this long red hair, an orange coat, and a red shawl. He was trained by his mother, who was a great Sufi, and then granted his spiritual authority to his daughter, Bai Rahat, who was respected as a saint by, again, also all of the scholars of the region. What's interesting is what he does is um, right kind of on his deathbed, he announces publicly and to his daughter that the 400 closest disciples that he has are his daughter's brothers. 
in effect, this becomes another workaround to, to gender segregation. And then what eventually happens is all of them and their respective tribes become a broader kind of extended family, which is not constrained by the restrictions on gender movement. Now, Bai Rahat then passes her spiritual mantle. By the way, these are her blessed shoes. Uh, she passes her spiritual mantle to another woman who then passes it on to another woman. And I've been fortunate not to have met many elders who personally knew the last of the, um, the Bais of this particular lineage. Now, um, the... Um, in my research, I delve deeply into the nature of female scholarly and saintly leadership and the origins of these exceptional models of authority. And today I'm gonna to touch upon a few aspects. Uh, in fact, this is gonna be, uh, so let's say my closing few minutes, so just bear with me here. It's noteworthy that Bibi Saiba and her successors paradigm of sainthood is very distinct from what is referred to as the theology of servitude. This is the ideal associated with mystics across religious traditions, with female mystics, of these retreats, these solitary acts of piety, many of them remain unmarried. Uh, Bibi Sahiba and the others are not marginal characters who simply play a supporting role in the life of male protagonists. On the contrary, most of these women are Sufi masters in their own right, guiding disciples outside the family, engaged in the practical management of the network, and are public teachers the entire time maintaining strict gender segregation, and to varying degrees, they were versed in law, theology, doctrine, scripture, and so forth, of course, to the degree that it's available. And most unusual, the discourses concerning them up till now make apparent that women's leadership in no co way contravenes orthodox Islamic doctrine. Again, for those who are familiar, the Naqshbandi Mujaddidi order means orthodoxy, literally from the Ottoman Empire to North India. So the model of authority that they all embodied and the expanded repertoire of their responsibilities uh, were, of course, a byproduct of their own efforts, their own excellence, of obviously the various biographers who wrote their lives down and the followers who retold their stories, and of the generally but not always male teachers who authorized them and so forth. But I argue, and this is one part of the broader thesis, that it's a culmination of a much longer process of authority transformation within Sufism. And a chief catalyst is Bibi Sahiba's 17th century spiritual ancestor, Sirhindi, the fountainhead of her Mujaddidi Sufi path, who in many ways defines Islamic orthodoxy in this period. Now, essentially, Sirhindi's theology is built upon the great 13th century Spanish mystic Ibn al-Arabi, who himself composed lengthy discourses on the fact that there was no spiritual qualification conferred on men that was denied to women. So that's the baseline. But beyond this, what Sir Hindi does is he rearticulates the priority of the Sufi path. He says that the most authoritative sources of knowledge are not some mystical tuition or experience, intuition or experiences. These are important, but they are secondary to the text, the holy texts, to scholarly consensus and deductive reasoning. In other words, that if you're gonna have mystical experiences, they better gel with the sources and all of the academic work that comes out of them. In several letters addressed to women, which echo what he says to men, he highlights the need for active involvement of women in the pursuit of knowledge, particularly to av avoid spiritual manipulations that were common at the time. In other words, be educated, know your faith, so you know what the spiritual practices are that you're getting into, and some fake spiritual guide can't take advantage of you. So it becomes necessary for women, as well as men, to study the sources, to protect themselves, to be able to discern correct spiritual practice from superstition. His injunctions help open the space for a cadre of women teachers who could impart knowledge of doctrine, theology, and law to women, even hygiene and basic comportment where required, as a precondition to the spiritual path. Like their male counterparts, they were trained in conflict resolution, in providing social counseling, even resolving land and marital disputes and providing medical and mental health services. Um, it begins with women within the family and then they will have other disciples and so on and so forth. And certainly within their own familial lineage, it is a must, uh, this sort of this 
whole base of knowledge, madrasa knowledge before entering into the spiritual path or at the same time, like in Bibi Sahiba's case. Now, interestingly, why is this happening in Peshawar, Kabul and Kandahar in the cities? Because the emphasis there on gender segregation in a sense allows for the development of parallel spiritual leadership. It creates literally a space for women to assume the leadership roles. It's simply much harder for men to teach women. So these become safe spaces. I mean, again, as if they were co-ed spaces, you would presumably continue to have male-dominated institutions, but this ends up creating something a little bit different. Then as more women excel as scholars and mystics, three things happen. More men acknowledge them as spiritual guides. The growing cadre of women then expands the boundaries of the Sufi order manifold. In new communities, they can now access one half the population in intimate settings and provide medical services, in fact, postnatal care. Third, the growth of, we see the growth of the Haram Sarai as a potent parallel institu institutional space, physical and con conceptual that's managed by women. So in summary, why does all of this matter? So first, as you probably will have noticed, these are stories that need to be told of an indigenous model of female leadership that exists within the moral framework of this region. Second, the built environment and hints in the literature point to many other contemporary women in leadership positions. And I'm gonna mention a brand new discovery from this summer. And I hope the, uh, the scholar who was with me on this journey, I believe may have actually logged in. A year after Bibi Sahiba's death, the largest or a year and a half, the largest Sufi network in the Eastern Afghan empire with 30,000 acres of land as their endowment. This is not an exaggeration. This is a place called Jamkani, right outside of Peshawar, was inherited by a Bibi Sayyada, the first of two female leaders of the order. The first sheikh of this particular, Sufi of this particular order is the one who authorized the king of Afghanistan, Ahmad Shah Abdali, to actually build his empire. And now we've got two women who are heading up the lineage. And what's interesting is that both barely show up in the hagiographies. And where I actually learned about them, again, this is for those who may be interested, who may know the area. One is a travel account by the soldiers of Sayyid Ahmad of Rai Bareilly, the, the famous Mujahideen movement in the 1920s who actually stay with Bibi Sayyida. And the other is Charles Mason, who ends up spending several nights and talks about Bibi Sayyida's library and so on and so forth, and about the, the hospitality that he receives. So the narratives of Bibi Sahiba and her successors, who are lucky, she's lucky enough to have that son who's a disciple, can actually provide context for those marginalized in the hagiographies. The key is she points to the existence of a significant world that has been erased. Now, in the conclusion of my book, I present a fascinating, what I can call a legal polemical text. It's written in the 2000s by a Sufi master from a deeply conservative Afghan Pakistan border town. It's a place called Bara. This is one of the epicenters of violence of the last sort of 20, 30 years. And this particular Sufi, Pir, was in fact at war with an extremist faction, very famous war that lasted for about a decade. Now, uh, by the way, he's one of he has one of the most important Sufi networks within Afghanistan. There were people within government um, and the network. I visited four of their centers in Herat and various other places. Uh, now, what happens is that three women, Sufis from Lahore in Pakistan, write to this gentleman complaining that some people are arguing that women cannot be Sufi masters. So he responds with a 20 page tract in Persian Arabic with an Urdu translation, another 20 page translation, arguing that it is completely valid with three pages on Bibi Sahiba's story as part of the evidence copied almost directly from the son's early 19th century biography. Thank you very much. And I will now unshare the screen. Thank you very much. That is absolutely fascinating. Um, I just wondered if you would take some questions. I think we may have some questions on the chat as, as well. So, um, anybody got anything they'd like to? Yes. I'd be interested to know in the relationship between this lineage and the rise of Wahhabism in the second half of the 19th century. Yeah. Thank you so 
Yes, I absolutely did. So thank you so much. Now, Wahhabism in its, okay, so it's a it's a highly contentious relationship. And in fact, the long story short, then I'll get into the broader story, is that because this particular lineage, the Mujaddidis, have a strong emphasis on Sharia and Sufism as two wings that are inseparable, they consider themselves to be the guardians of orthodoxy. In fact, I would argue up till the, up till the modern day. The Deoband Madrasa is actually also deeply connected to this particular order. Now, although Wahhabism as we know it doesn't really appear in this region until the 20th century, until actually the rise of the Saudi state, we have some movements that we can call proto-Wahhabi. And the first of these movements is actually the, the fellow, the Mujahideen army who stays with Bibi Sayyidah, as a matter of fact. Now, what makes these people a little bit different, these sort of these new entrants, is that they are doing several things that are actually breaking norms. One of the things they're doing is they're practicing takfir. They're declaring other Muslims to be kafir, to be outside the pale of Islam. In Hanafi jurisprudence, which is the school of, of law that is um, that exists in this region, this is a rather interesting situation because you can, if someone declares another Muslim who calls himself a Muslim, to be outside of Islam, that person themselves becomes outside of Islam. It's a rather interesting little uh, kind of uh, spiral. So what ends up happening is that these, these sort of proto-Wahhabi groups are coming in and they're doing several things. They're undermining the authority of the shrines and the Sufi practices to a certain degree. And what they're doing is they're declaring other Muslims to be outside the pale of Islam for what they do and then declaring war against them. So it is this particular order based in... Peshawar, based in Kabul, based in Kandahar, uh, based in, especially in the sort of broader um, Afghan, uh, ethnic Afghan regions, that then wages a brutal theological assault against this movement, basically de declaring Wahhabism to be outside of orthodoxy. In fact, the type of words that they use are just like the people of error. Um, the, um, in fact, they get, <laughs> they become quite insulting after a while, but um, there's a whole sequence of, of um, sort of, um, in fact, I was at one stage going to write, a, I'd write a book on this. I've collected so much material from this region. So then what happens is each time any social movement emerged within this greater, let's say, Pakhtun, Afghan um, area, which bore any resemblance to what was happening to Wahhabism, it was uh, generally theologically attacked and never was able to take, to get a foothold there. So what's rather interesting is that in North India, it sort of does. But even today, and what I'm saying is going to raise a lot of questions here, in the vast majority of Afghanistan, if you use the W word, Wahhabism, you're liable to get into severe trouble because the memory of this discourse is actually very, very much alive. So when you do have, let's say, Wahhabi ideologies flowing in in the 1980s, 1990s, they generally are done through alternative mechanisms. Um, either they're done without actually uttering who um, the, the source is, or they are instilled within, let's say, madrasa curricula, or they will ascribe to a the Shafi'i school of law, which is not at all what Wahhabism is in line with, and claim that these are Shafi'i Sunni interpretations. So uh, by and large, this is the, um, this is, it's a very fascinating story of, of sort of Wahhabism versus the Mujaddidis that kind of continues on well into the 21st century. And I have ask the same question. Um, you, thank you for updating about Afghanistan, but would you say the same is true in Pakistan? You know, the replacement of a lot of these shrines with what are in effect Saudi-funded glass Wahhabi mosques. Yeah. Um, no, it's actually different in, well, it is and it's not. And it depends really where you're talking about in, in Pakistan. So first of all, I mean, you've had, again, the, that, the 1980s, the Afghan war era, where you start having um, all sorts of uh, funding from particular parts of the world to finance institutions to change the ideological makeup of this broader region. One can argue not this broader region. This is also happening in America. In fact, American Islam completely transforms in this period as well. So this is this is absolutely happening. But um, the the Mujaddidi and, in fact, the various other Sufi orders um, existing within both Pakistan and Afghanistan have a much larger person-to-person -person support base and deeper authority than any of these newfound networks, who are, of course, very very well funded. 
So you'll find in areas where there's a, let's say, a direct clash. So I'm working in North Waziristan right now with a major Mujaddidi order. In fact, we're doing a, um, a it's a project to um, collect manuscripts and digitize and, and uh, um, through several Sufi centers there. So in places like that, when the war was in full force, you, the sort of the more Wahhabi leaning organizations would be forced to actually bomb shrines and then disinter the bodies of saints in order to prove that the old order is gone. But there are very few places apart from, let's say, targeted um, attacks on certain shrines that were more, I would say, um, shows of power than, let's say, any systematic um, push to take over a region. So where you actually, but by and large, the um, the uh, uh, the regions in which they were not able to, let's say, uh, take control, political control, uh, they were not effectively able to challenge a lot of the Sufi movements. So as the, in fact, post 2014, you actually see a massive growth in the Sufi orders um, in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, in fact, uh, for better or for worse, uh, it's it's a it's kind of mushrooming. The the um, written material has basically taken off, and the polemical the polemic as a um, as a genre has also taken off. So it is. Uh, I would say that it's. Uh, I would absolutely agree that the '80s and '90s have had a major effect on the landscape, but not an effect to wipe out the existence of these networks, except in regions that were directly in the firing line, and that would be the, the uh, federally administered tribal areas. Any other questions? Well, I think, have we got anything on the chat? Uh, I see something about the Naqshbandis and the 12 Imams. Perhaps oh, I can, um, all right. Yes. Would you like um, to? <laughs> yeah, okay, that, that's a great question. Uh, yes and no. It's always the um, it's always the answer. So because both are claiming authority of well, first of all, I should say the twelve imams are a little bit different. Um, up to Imam eleven, as you're well aware, the imams in the Sunnis and Sh Sunni and Shia theological tradition are exactly the same. But there's a, a difference with regards to who the twelfth imam is. Whether that's the imam who's the Mahdi who goes into a perpetual occultation as opposed to in the Sunni source where the 11th Imam has had a son by the name of Abdullah and then the possibly other sons and then the it sort of goes on and at some stage the Mahdi will be born. So apart from the 12th, both the Shias and the Sunnis in places like let's say Samarkand in the 15th century or Baghdad or Kabul, or Kabul in the 18th century, both the Shia and the Sunnis are claiming the authority of the Imams. Which basically means that there are a lot of polemics, because the closer you are, the more you're going to call each other out. Um, so you will find uh, lots of anti-Shia polemics uh, from within the Naqshbandis and um, certainly the other side as well. That said, there behind the scenes between the polemics, there is a lot of exchange and sharing and textual, let's say, um, gestation that is happening on on both sides. So. Um, in the Mujaddidis actually believe that uh, in order to attain any form of sainthood, one needs to literally go through the imamat. That is a necessary sort of, um, let's say, channel through which to achieve um, your, um, to realize oneself. We have any other questions? Well, uh, Dr. Um, Zia, thank you very, very much um, for your, your uh, talk, and I do hope that you'll be able to come to London one day and see us in person and deliver another lecture, and it was certainly really very interesting and fascinating, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for having me, and it would be, of course, a pleasure to, to visit, and I will certainly let you know next time I'm in town. Once again, a lot of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much.